For the past century or so, American Christianity especially has led the way introducing a novel theology of dispensationalism. Attached to this has been numerous doomsday prophets, each of them saying the great tribulation is right around the corner, with every war and rumor of war in the Middle East being some preliminary to the great tribulation. And each of these predictions have been wrong over and over and over again. And future predictions will be wrong over and over and over. Every single one will be wrong. And why is that? Because these things already happened. Jesus already told us that they already happened. The larger context of the Olivet Discourse tells us that the Great Tribulation and these signs of the coming of the Great Tribulation, these birth pangs, these beginning of sorrows, these wars and rumors of wars, is not something in our future. It was something in their future, but in our past. Uh, they were something that took place within the time of Jesus' Jesus's, uh, audiences, uh, audience. So to review the context very, very quickly, in Matthew 23, Jesus issues this litany of maledictions against the leadership of Israel. Woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. All the blood from Abel to Zechariah is going to come on this generation. And it ends with Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. And then how does the Olivet, it goes immediately into the Olivet Discourse. And how does that begin? The disciples are asking about the temple and the end of the age. These are not discrete questions. They are connected. These are the same thing. Jesus says the temple is going to blow up, thus concluding the end of the age. Furthermore, Jesus then describes what's popularly known as the Great Tribulation. He uses that phrase, Great Tribulation. We didn't read it in our reading today, but it's later. And he ends further after that saying that all of these things are going to happen within this generation, okay? So that's just putting it in its preteristic context, okay? Today, what we're going to review is what Jesus calls kingdom rising against kingdom, nation against nation, wars and rumors of wars. Uh, the things that uh, Jesus says are the beginning of sorrows, that's a kind of uh, dynamic equivalent translation. It's, uh, that word sorrows is like a birth pang. It's a particular type of sorrow. It's painful. Um, and, and this is sometimes it's translated that way as well. And these are the preliminaries to the Great Tribulation, okay? Um, and, and perhaps that they, they, they might overlap at some point. I'm actually not totally sure when these preliminary signs of the times um, end and the Great Tribulation begins. It could be um, that the Great Tribulation is purely Vespasian's siege of Israel, but it could be that the Great Tribulation is the Jewish revolt from 66 all the way through to 73. I'm not totally sure. The way I'm framing it is that um, these wars and rumors of wars are the Jewish uh, revolt from 66 AD to 70 AD. This is the time frame we're going to go through today. And then the Great Tribulation is Vespasian siege of Israel, which is 70 AD, and then the subsequent horrors that happened all the way to 73. Um, I'm open to, uh, uh, I'm amenable to discussing um, these particular um, uh, timelines, and I welcome them to anybody here or, or online who has uh, insight into these. Okay, so uh, what's the historical context? We, we see this in the Gospels themselves. One of the disciples was, was Simon the Zealot, right? Okay, what is it? The Zealots were the ones who were really angry that the Romans were occupying the land, right? The land was given to God's people, okay? So it's not like it was unprecedented that they were angry about this, right? Um, this kind of hostility against Rome just skyrocketed ever since the, the Olivet Discourse. It started to get more and more intense, and particularly starting with um, 66 AD, we see a lot of rival groups infighting in Jerusalem particularly. There's about three of them, and they're fighting and warring with each other all the way up to the destruction of, of uh, the temple. Uh, they were, these, these zealots, <laughs> To put it provocatively, they were the kinds of people who really loved their constitutional rights, and they liked to go to gun ranges and collect ammunition, and, and they loved God a lot, okay? So th there is a sense in which these people are us in a way. We might, they're not, but we would identify with them, and it kind of shows that, that this kind of rightly motivated anger can be 
not God sanctioned. And we'll get into this later. So um, Jesus, uh, uh, Josephus rather, uh, Josephus, this Jewish historian, he tells us about one of these groups called the Sicarii. Sicarii is this word that basically means dagger men or assassinator or, or robber. And the Sicarii were these Jewish, Jewish zealots opposed to Roman occupation and opposed to Jews who were sympathetic to Roman o- occupation. And what they would do is that they would mingle themselves in crowds during festivals in the daytime and they would have these concealed daggers under their clothes and they would stab and they would stab their enemies. They would they would seek out particular people, assassinate them. They would fall down on the ground and they would act shocked just like everybody else. And they would pretend that they didn't know what was going on. And they they started by assassinating the high priest of the temple and they killed someone every day after that. And um, uh, this kind of. Uh, formed this panic in Jerusalem. Josephus says everybody expected death every hour as men do in war. It, it was just people dying every single day. Um, okay, so that's, that's, this is in 66 AD. So this is kind of one of the first things that's starting to happen. Jesus says to beware of false messiahs, false prophets. Um, he mentions this several times in the Olivet Discourse. Josephus records a nameless group. He doesn't say who they were. They believed they were inspired by God, that they would receive guidance from God. And they went out to the wilderness and they amassed a certain following. And Felix, one of the governors at the time, he was worried that this was going to result in a revolt. And so he just sent uh, soldiers out there and he killed them all. They all died. There was an Egyptian false prophet who also gathered to himself 30,000 men, a pretty sizable number. And these two were also in the wilderness, just kind of wandering around the wilderness. They were even at the Mount of Olives, the very place that Jesus was issuing his prophecy. And they surrounded the city. This is one of these moments where there's several times where armies surround the city. It's not just Vespasian. So um, they're about to storm the city, but Felix, the same one, he sends uh, his Roman soldiers out there and he kills all of them as well. Um, He took a number, well, he didn't kill all of them. He took a number as prisoners and then the rest were dispersed, okay? Uh, Josephus tells us, so I mean, here's kind of a direct application of Jesus saying, don't follow these guys. Like Jesus is saving people from this annihilation here. Uh, Josephus tells us that after this, a company of, so they're all dispersed. He says that a company of robbers and deceivers, he uses that phrase quite often, they got together and they persuaded the Jews to revolt, to assert their freedom from Rome and, and to their, their freedom from those who sympathize with Rome. And they would just start ambushing people. They would plunder houses of great men. They would kill wealthy men. Uh, they would ravage uh, the wives of these men. Uh, they would set villages on fire. Josephus says all Judea was filled with the effects of their madness, and thus the flame was every day more and more blown up till it came to direct war. So we see Judea is on fire here with this kind of insanity. Florus, a Roman procurator over Jerusalem, so just kind of a Roman governor there in Jerusalem, uh, he had taken money from the temple treasury, and he said it was for the emperor. And everybody in Jerusalem openly mocked him by passing around a basket uh, to collect money for him as if Florus was poor, like like he needed the money. So they were they were taking up a collection for him and mocking him. Um, And Florus responded to this um, by uh, issuing a stern letter. No, that's not what he did. He he crucified thirty six hundred Roman Jews. He crucified them and he scourged them as well. Um, Something unprecedented. The Jews that were, uh, that had Roman citizenship would not be crucified. But he's breaking precedent here. So we we see things kind of spiraling out of control, even out of these petty slights where he was wrong in the first place. 
Um, Josephus rec records this. This is interesting. At the same time, Eleazar, and this Eleazar becomes one of the leaders of the Zealots, the son of Ananias, the high priest, which I, I don't know this, but I wonder if this is a similar Ananias um, that we see in the New Testament. I don't know. Uh, a very bold youth who was at the, that time governor of the temple persuaded those that officiated in the divine service to receive no gift or sacrifice from any foreigner. And this was the true beginning of our war with the Romans. So you have this zealot shut down. What's happening in Jerusalem is people from all over the world are coming and there's God fearers everywhere offering their sacrifices. They would bring their sacrifices to the priest and the priest would sacrifice it. And this zealot is saying no foreigners, only Jews. And you contrast this with, with is what's happening at the church at the time, which is in exactly the inverse, where we're saying everybody can bring their sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving to the living God. So you see this kind of narrowing of the Jewish church and this broadening of the true church. Um, and, and it's interesting that Josephus says this was the beginning of our war with, with Rome. Okay. Um, so there's this treaty that Eleazar makes with the Romans. Um, um, and then Eliezer and his men, they break this treaty and they kill uh, several Roman soldiers. Um, this is also something of the beginning of the war, uh, the beginning of birth pains, uh, the, the beginning of sorrows. And then this is where things start to get kind of wild. So we see Eliezer break this truth, he, truce. He kills some Romans. Josephus says at the same hour, at the same hour, 20, I don't know the preliminaries just because I didn't look it up, but he says at the same hour, 20,000 Jews were killed in Caesarea. Caesarea is about an hour and a half drive northwest of Jerusalem. He, Josephus says, uh, all Caesarea was emptied of its Jewish inhabitants. Okay, so, so there, there's, there's, this, there's more kind of convulsions going on to this. In response to this, the, the, all the Jews throughout Israel, they get really upset. They start burning down Syrian cities in Israel, and it appears they burn down cities as far north as Asia Minor, where many of the letters of the, of the Bible are written to. Um, Joseph, Josephus says these cities were plundered, men were slaughtered, um, and the cities were burnt to the ground. So you have the Israelites retaliating out of, out, of, out of vengeance for this. So basically the entire Near East at this time was, is what CNN would call a peaceful Black Lives Matter protest. That's basically what we see in the Near East. Everything is on fire and there's violence uh, everywhere. Um, and it's done with the same level of justification too. So what happens is some of the Syrians, they join the Jews in, in these attacks. So you actually see you see allied um, wars be with Jews and Syrians against Jews and Syrians. And so Syrians start suspecting other Syrians as not being loyalists, that they're actually traitors to the Jews. And so you see Syrians start butchering each other as well. So we have nations rising up against nations here. There's this constant suspicion of who the, who, who's loyal to who. Josephus says the daytime was spent in shedding of blood and the night in fear. It was then common to see cities filled with dead bodies still lying unburied and those of old men mixed with infants all dead and scattered about together. Women also lay amongst them without any covering for their nakedness. You might see the whole province full of inexpressible calamities. It's pretty horrific stuff here in one city. Uh, Scythopolis, north of Jerusalem, about 100 miles, there were 13,000 Jews that were killed um, while they were sleeping at night. Their throats were slit. They were actually allies with the Scytha, Scythalopitans, and they suspected that they weren't loyal, and so they actually did this treaty thing with them, and they, they kind of lulled them into this peace, peace treaty, and then they went in at night and they, they slit their throats. Th 13,000. In another city, 2,500 Jews were put to death. Um, another city, 2,000 Jews were killed. Um, others were in prison. Uh, Tyre put a great number to death and kept a great number in prison. Um, Hippos and Gadara did similarly, putting to death the boldest but keeping others um, in custody. And then this is what happened in most of Syria as well. Josephus says of the Jews, this is fascinating, everyone either hated them or were afraid of them. 
though he does list a few cities as examples, Antioch being one of them, uh, as, as exceptions. Um, so not everyone hated them, but a lot of people did. So this is all happening in 66 AD, right? This is the beginning of the, the Jewish revolt. And there's, this one, there's another one. So th this is all generally happening in Israel, but we have examples of it happening pretty um, uh, outside of Israel as well. There is a place called the Delta. Um, it was a city called Delta in Egypt. And um, there was a, a Roman ruler gave permission. The Jews were resisting there as well. Jews actually had a pretty prominent place there um, uh, going back to Alexander the Great. Um, but they started resisting their Roman rulers. And uh, I think the ruler at the time was actually named Alexander. And he gave the Roman, the Roman soldiers permission to kill and they killed without mercy and they were permitted to plunder them. And, and Josephus says this, no mercy was shown to infants and no regard to the aged, but they went on in slaughter of persons of every age till all the place was overflowed with blood and 50,000 of them lay dead upon heaps. Th that's just shy of the amount of American soldiers killed in the Vietnam War. That's one instance. The populace of Alexandria bear so great a hatred to the Jews, Josephus says this. Okay, uh, so we're moving into uh, 67 AD. The Jews attempt to take a city called Sephorus uh, in Galilee, and uh, they, they're trying to take it from the Romans. And by this time, Emperor Nero, he dispatches Vespasian to the Near East, to Israel, to start to uh, quench these revolts, okay? So Vespasian is starting to arrive in Israel. So he's in Israel a long time before he actually sieges, uh, sieges Jerusalem. Um, so they tried to take this city, and Josephus tells us this, the Romans, out of the anger they bore at this attempt, were night and day burning down places in the plain, stealing cattle that were in the country, killing whatever appeared capable of fighting, and leading weaker people away as slaves into captivity. We have another captivity happening here. And he says, so that Galilee was all over filled with fire and blood. And then we come to the summer of 67, which makes me think of that Brian Adams song, the summer of 69. As far as I know, there were no Jews reminiscing about how great the summer of 67 was. This was not a good time. There was a key rebel stronghold in Galilee called Jotapata or Yodfat. It was destroyed by Vespasian and it was a 47 day siege and he killed 40,000 Jews in this siege. And this is the place where Josephus was actually a general in the war. They're defeated and Vespasian takes Josephus as like his servant or patron, or I can't remember exactly what the name of it is, but Josephus gets conscripted into basically working for the Romans and Josephus is like, okay, I guess I will. Um, uh, let's see here. He says, oh yeah, there were 40,000 40, men were killed in the taking of the city. Women and infants were sold into slavery and the rest of the city was burnt down. Um, okay. Uh, we have several zealots who escaped this city. Um, or, or not just this city, but most cities in the area. And they started congregating in uh, Joppa, which is where modern Tel Aviv is. And um, they actually, from the, Joppa was actually destroyed already. And they, so it was kind of like this post-apocalyptic kind of gathering point. And they actually started launching these like pirate campaigns from there. They became these pirates, um, which does anybody remember? what the pirates and veggie tales did? Any of the kids remember? The veggie tail pirates? What do they do? We are the pirates who don't do anything. We stay at home and lay around. We don't do anything. And if you ask us to do anything, we tell you. We won't do anything. <laughs> so these pirates did stuff. Uh, these pirates were not veggie tail pirates. They were so bothersome to the entire Medita Mediterranean world. Um, Josephus, uh, what does he say? Oh, I, I, think I, I think I actually don't have. Um, 
Oh, he says, Josephus says, he, they made the seas unnavigable to all men. <laughs> so they're, they're this nuisance to the entire world, right? And uh, basically what happens is Vespasian, he sets up there in Joppa. And the way that the, the, way that the uh, harbor is, it's not a very conducive harbor to ships. It's really rocky. And what happened is these pirates, these Jewish pirates, would sleep on the ships um, because they couldn't come ashore because Vespasian was there. And what happened is Josephus says a dark north wind came and it destroyed all of these ships. It started smashing them against the harbor. Some of the men tried to come ashore. Vespasian would kill them. Other men committed suicide, and then others were just simply killed um, in this great north wind that dashed uh, these ships against each other and against the, the rocky shoreline. Uh, 4,200 4, men uh, were killed here, according to uh, Josephus. He says, the sea was bloody a long way, and the maritime parts were full of dead bodies. So we have a sea kind of turned to blood here. The Jews at Terracao were slain on every side. The Romans annihilated the Jews who fought on the Sea of Galilee. Um, they would destroy their ships. They would cut the heads off or the hands off of any Jew that was trying to um, seek um, to surrender. They were swimming to them. The, the Romans would take them and they'd either cut their head off or cut their hands off. Um, the number killed here was 6,500. Um, the lake was turned to blood and full of dead bodies. Josephus says not one of them escaped. He says the shore was filled with shipwrecks and dead bodies that swelled from the sun's heat and putrefied and corrupted the air with this grotesque stench. He says this uh, not only made things miserable for the Jews in the area, but it made things miserable for those who hated the Jews. Like it only fueled that as well. Okay. Um, so move on to the civil war here in Jerusalem, and then we'll close uh, things out. Uh, in, a, in a previous sermon, I had mentioned that um, uh, one zeal zealot faction let the Edomites in, and the e Edomites plundered and killed a lot of people. Um, but but they, uh, they pillaged the city. They caused the outer temple court to be overflowed with blood, uh, leaving 8,500 dead bodies. They killed the high priest. Um, Josephus set, marks this as, as the beginning of destruction of the city. So we actually, I think, might be making our way to the, the Great Tribulation here as well. The, the Edomites were another army that surrounded the city. Um, he says 12,000 more were killed throughout the city. He said people couldn't even weep for their families out of fear of being killed for themselves. At night, they would toss a little dust on the corpses that lined the streets. So um, this, is, this is kind of a pretty horrific time as well. Um, okay, so at this point, people who wanted to escape Jerusalem were not allowed. The zealots would kill them uh, unless they had enough money to bribe the zealots. So rich people were able to get out, but poor people were usually killed. Um, and then the zealots didn't let anybody burn, uh, uh, bury the bodies. So again, we have bodies being heaped up on the roads and, and putrefied by the sun. So it was this kind of, it was this very disgustingly smelling uh, city during this time. Um, there was a man named Simon. He, he was one, a leader of one of the factions. Uh, he had an army of 40,000, and he went throughout uh, Idumea per, uh, perpetually shedding blood and destroying the vegetation and the farmland of the area. His wife is eventually captured by the zealots. They bring, bring her to Jerusalem. Simon comes with his army, another army surrounding Jerusalem, and um, he, he, he kind of starts sieging it, but basically anybody who comes outside to gather herbs or sticks, he would cut their hands off. So you have, at this moment, you have about three different zealot groups and you have the Romans. So there was this fear of the Romans. There's a fear of the zealots under Simon. There's a fear of the zealots under a guy named John. And there's a fear of the zealots under a guy named Eleazar, who we talked about. So this is kind of the landscape of Jerusalem at about 67 or so. Um, might be 68 here. Um, and I'll talk about uh, the, the zealots under John and then we'll end. Josephus talks about the zealots under John were insatiable in plundering Jerusalem. Um, they would loot homes of the wealthy. They would murder the residents and abuse women. We've heard this before. But he says it was sport to them. 
Furthermore, these men would dress up like women. They were transvestites. Josephus says they indulged themselves in feminine wantonness, decking their hair, putting on women's garments, painting their eyes, and wearing women's ornaments. They would indulge in the lust of women, too. They invented unlawful pleasures of all sorts. Furthermore, they would parade up and down the street. Do Josephus describes them looking and walking like women. He says they walked with this feminine gait. And then they would attack men like warriors. They would draw a sword out from under their dress and start murdering people. So Jerusalem, at this point, was basically a perpetual gay pride parade with a whole lot more murder. That's what Jerusalem was at this time. The people of Jerusalem were terrified of this, of these, these, these homosexual transvestites killing everybody. So they invited Simon in, the, guys who, the guy whose wife was stolen. They invite him in for relief. They, they, they make this treaty with him, invite him in. Simon comes in and he breaks the treaty with everybody and he turns on everybody. He turns on his allies and he turns on the other zealots. Um, and so you have Simon coming in who's angry about his wife being stolen, and then you have the transvestite homosexual zealots, and they start this war against each other. Um, but Simon, if I understood it correctly, sometimes Josephus is kind of hard to understand, um, he had what um, Josephus calls these engines that threw darts. So I think it was kind of like, um, uh, I, I don't know, some kind of machinery that threw javelins and stuff, and stones, it's like a catapult. And, and he says, by this, he killed many of the priests who were offering sacrifices, but he wasn't doing it on purpose. It was like the temple was uh, being caught in this collateral damage. And so Simon, he actually permits people to continue bringing their sacrifices to the, to the temple, but his stones and his darts and his javelins would keep killing people in the vicinity of the temple and the altar. This is what Josephus says. For those darts that were thrown by the engines came with that force... And they went all over the buildings and reached as far as the altar and the temple itself and fell upon the priests and those that were about to uh, about the sacred offices insomuch that in any person who came thither with great zeal from the ends of the earth to offer sacrifices at the celebrated place, which was esteemed holy by all mankind fell down before their own sacrifices themselves and sprinkled the altar, which was venerable among all men, both Greeks and barbarians with their own blood, till the dead bodies of strangers were mingled together with those of their own country and those of profane persons, with those of the priest and the blood of all sorts of dead carcasses stood in lakes in the holy courts themselves." So you have people trying to offer sacrifices and they themselves basically become the sacrifice. They're sprinkling the blood and there's corpses piling up here. Um, and it says that they stood in lakes in the holy courts. And then here's, here's kind of the last thing that happens. Both John and Simon, these two these leaders, they set fire to the storehouses. These, the, in ancient times, you had storehouses that would be able to keep you through a siege. And because what a siege is, it's when an army surrounds the city and they basically keep you from getting any supplies or bringing any supplies in or going out. It's basically trying to starve you out to, into surrendering. And, and, and basically, John and Simon set fire to their storehouses, which Josephus says would have lasted them many years. And they, and they burnt them on purpose. Uh, it says that uh, Simon burnt them to serve the Romans. So the civil war was so bad that the people of Jerusalem hoped for relief by an external war with, with Rome, uh, which would come, but it would not be a relief. Things only get worse once Rome comes, and uh, we'll talk about that uh, next time. I believe that that's the great tribulation that Jesus mentions. But what can we take from this? Uh, th this, uh, this has been kind of a, something of an exercise because it's really, I mean, I guess I've approached this simply just to understand what does the Bible say, you know, um, and, and it, the, the dispensational and really amillennial and premillennial explanations I find incredibly unconvincing. And so just studying the history, I think, helps us to understand what Jesus is talking about here. That's one thing. Um, it's just a better way of understanding Jesus's prophecies. Um, and, and, and these things vindicate Jesus as a prophet. 
It's more vindication of who he is, that what he said actually happened. Um, and we don't have to do these weird gymnastics uh, in explaining. It helps us avoid kind of the hysteria of the end of days kind of madness type stuff. Uh, we're able to remain kind of more sober. We're not so easily suckered by the doomsday prophets. I think that's another advantage. Uh, something else too, the historical context put in, puts into perspective the exhortations by Peter and Paul to submit to the governing authorities. It puts into context Jesus' statement about living by the sword and dying by the sword. Think of the contrast between submissive Christians who were good citizens of Rome, living by the word of God, and the Jews who were these terrible citizens, making life miserable for everyone throughout the entire Near East and living by the sword. Is there not a greater distinction between these two kinds of people? Jesus' warning served to keep his sheep from following these zealots and false messiahs who were claiming freedom and liberation from Rome. All of these attempts were met with fierce Roman brutality. Um, but as Peter says in his letter, God knows how to save the righteous. We've been uh, going through Peter, uh, Peter's letter. Um, he provides a way of escape, a way of salvation, whether it is Noah through the ark, Lot through the angels, uh, the Israelites through the Red Sea, and here, Christians through the words of Christ and his apostles, avoiding really real damnation, so to speak, really real judgment, escaping these things, just like Sodom and Gomorrah was a real city that really got destroyed they were able to escape as well if they listened to what Jesus was saying. But of course, Christians were experiencing trials and tribulation too. Nero was putting to death Christians, not nearly the same numbers as the, the Jews, but there was persecution of the Christians. But they died for very different reasons. They died for their savior. They died for obeying heaven. Uh, they died for obeying God, where the Jews died in rebellion to God. They died as a result of saying, let his blood be on us. They were invoking a curse on themselves. And, and so one was commendable and honorable. I, I've, I had a friend once describe martyrdom as God's way of honoring a man. I think that that's really true. Um, but the, the death of the Jews was embarrassing and it's, it's shameful. And I think history has proven this. Furthermore, who, which group overtook Rome? Who's the one who, who got Rome in, in the end? The Christians did. The Christians took Rome and the Jews did not. So I think that that's another kind of vindication. History has shown as one contemporary, as one of your poets have, have uh, as one of your own poets have said, the Christians won everything, <laughs> right? The Christians won everything. And so we, consider, we, we, we can consider these things in our time, operating the same way as Christians then, being good citizens in the kingdom of men, but never at the expense of being uh, first citizens of the kingdom of God. We may be martyred, we may die for God, but not in the way the Jewish zealots died. Ultimately, we will, be, uh, we will put to shame the world by our blameless conduct. This is really Peter's uh, uh, exhortation um, by our prayers for the civil authorities. We pray for our civil authorities and by our pure consciences we, we provide this distinction uh, from the rest of the world. So uh, let's, uh, let's go ahead and pray. The charge is this, take heed that no one deceives you. During the last days of the old covenant age, many false prophets and false messiahs came deceiving many. And those who followed them were literally slaughtered in that deception. We live in similar times, the end of an age where all kinds of false teachers are vying for our loyalties, vying for your following. And while we are not living in a time of physical slaughter like the Israelites, we are living in a time of spiritual slaughter following false teachers, false messiahs, false prophets can destroy your soul. So take heed that no one deceives you.
And how do you do this? You follow the true teacher, the true prophet, the true Messiah. You do this by eating the word of God. You keep it in your heart. You obey it. If you are not obeying it, you will be subject to the deception. You will slowly begin to accept the compromises and sins of our age and be swept up in the judgments of our age. But if you abide in truth and seek to test the spirits that come to you, subjecting them to the authority of Jesus in all things, you will do well. You will remain sober-minded and cast down every imagination and high thing that tries to exalt itself against the knowledge of God. So take heed that no one deceives you. You will not be swept away like those in the day of Noah. For the Lord knows how to save his people. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, may God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. May he give the blessings of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you, that you may take possession of the land of your sojournings that God gave to Abraham.